much you all. Um, I would like now to, to start the keynote lecture um, by uh, Dr. Caroline Ekman, but I will pass, uh, first I will pass uh, the word to, to Professor Clara Prakana. She will introduce our invited guests. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, uh, Caroline. I'm sorry for delay, but I did not control these previous sessions, and uh, I'm sorry for that. I speak in the name of the organization. Uh, let me introduce uh, Dr. Caroline Hickman to everybody. This, this is the first time I think that we have a, a talk about uh, climate change and the anxiety that derives from it. And I, I, we thought that you were the best person to talk about it. Dr. Caroline Big Hickman uh, is a lecturer at the University of Bath in social work and climate psychology. She's a practicing psychotherapist and board, mem board member of the Climate Psychology Alliance, CPA, to which I, I too belong. In CPA, we are develop supporting development of a range of therapeutic outreach projects and supporting development of a service providing climate crisis aware psychotherapy. So this is her area of expertise, and I think that her lecture was for itself. And Caroline. Thank you so much for the introduction, Clara. And it's not a problem starting late at all. Everybody needs to have their space to be heard. And thank you to the previous presenter. I got to listen to quite a lot of your presentation. It was very interesting for me. So I want to just see if I can share my screen, okay? Okay. Does that come through okay? Yes, yes. Is that fine? Good. So thank you so much for this invitation. As uh, Clara said, I'm a lecturer at the University of Bath and have a psychotherapy practice. And my psychotherapy practice really has increased massively, particularly in the last three or four years, uh, particularly with people bringing problems about eco-anxiety or climate distress. I'm working with children, with young people and with adults, and I'll try and give some <clears throat> some case examples to cover the range of work that I'm doing as well as give a theoretical frame and, and talk about some of the psychological implications of this emergent psychological mental health problem. I frame the talk really as talking about climate crisis aware psychotherapy, climate crisis aware psychology, but I want to take us on a journey this afternoon through eco-anxiety to a, an eco-awareness to start to think about how actually eco-anxiety is not a mental illness but it's an emotionally very mentally healthy congruent response to the reality of what we're facing in the world today increasingly globally. I've also been researching with children and young people globally in the Maldives and Vanuatu and Bangladesh, Nigeria and across Europe and Brazil. So I will use some quotes from young people as well to try and illustrate some of the difference in the way, for example, that adults might be feeling this in comparison to children and young people. I want to start with a, a, a narrative from a therapy session this week from a young woman in America, in the United States. And she's given permission for me to share this story because it's a perfect illustration really of how eco-anxiety manifests in people. She's uh, very happy in her life. She's secure in her job. She likes where she lives. She's happy in her relationship with her partner. She's not got significant problems in her family, just usual family stresses periodically. She's in her late twenties. So you've got a picture of somebody with a lot of security in their life and wouldn't normally be sort of coming to psychotherapy saying this part of my life or that part of my life is a problem. But she's come specifically for therapy around her eco-anxiety, which disables her to the point where she can't get out of bed. She can't leave her house. And what happened? And then through therapy, she starts to recover and she starts to feel more resilient and more able to go back out into the world. But one of the problems with eco-anxiety is the primary trigger is the weather. And the weather is not something we can avoid being aware of or being in relationship with. So last week she was giving me the example of the in the part of the United States she's living. It had been very warm, very hot for a few days. 
And on Tuesday evening, she heard the weather report, which said it was going to snow the next day. Now, this is completely out of keeping. It's disproportionate. It's out. It's not normal for this time of year. And it immediately started to trigger anxiety in her. And the first thing she thought, which I think is really clear, is she said, they've got it wrong. The weather reporters have got it wrong. They have to have got it wrong. So she went straight into a form of denial as a way of trying to protect herself from the overwhelming anxiety and terror that she knew would be likely to follow. She genuinely believed that the reporters had got it wrong until she got up the next morning and opened her curtains and there was the snow all over the road and all over her car. And she managed to drive to work. She went to work with mounting anxiety and caught between thinking to herself, oh, isn't it pretty? Because it was very pretty and the sun was shining on the snow. And then slipping into, oh, but all the plants will die, all the flowers will die because it's spring and there were lots of flowering plants around, which she knew would die under the snow. She managed to get to work OK. And she said she works in an office space where there aren't many windows. So she was able to kind of shut the weather out for the rest of the day. Unfortunately, her mother kept sending her text messages throughout the day, commenting on the snow and how the snow would be killing all the vegetables and seedlings that she'd just planted the previous week. So the anxiety was mounting and mounting and mounting. She managed to drive home. By the time she got home, the anxiety was overwhelming her. And the only thing she could do to manage it was to close the curtains and stop herself from engaging with the outside world to try and cope. And she was quite relieved that we had a therapy session that evening. So we were able to kind of get her anxieties back to a manageable state. But I wanted to give that as an illustration because I think it's a perfect illustration of how we can't manage eco-anxiety in the same way as we might try to manage and support clients in managing other forms of anxiety because the triggers are constant and the triggers are increasingly bad all the time. You only have to read the newspapers, you only have to look at the news, you only have to look outside your window really um, to start to see that the climate is worsening. And so those triggers are happening constantly for people and they cannot be rationalized away because it is a reality. And as I said, we measure mental health by looking at people's capacity to emotionally respond to external reality. And so to respond with anxiety and distress is a mentally healthy response. The problem is, is that the mentally healthy response is sometimes so great that people are unable to function. So hopefully that's introduced it clearly. I just need to show you this guy. This is Murphy. He's the other beating heart in the house. He's a my much loved 13 year old Labradoodle. Um, and I'm not gonna shut him out because he'll think he's done something terribly, terribly wrong. So he's on the sofa next to me, but he's very old. He's the equivalent of 94 years old, really. So if you hear him snoring, cause he's heard all this before or coughing, don't worry. It's just this guy in the background. I always introduce him now. Part of the Climate Psychology Alliance has a slogan about the importance of facing difficult truths. The Climate Psychology Alliance was a group set up over 10 years ago to support people in having these psychological conversations about the climate emergency. Why bring psychology into this, you might say? Well, of course, we need technological, political, economic solutions to the climate and biodiversity crisis. However, we've had the technological solutions for over 10 years, uh, or if not more, and we've failed to act on this. So the Climate Psychology Alliance has been set up to not just look at the impact of this psychologically on people, but also to try and think about how we need to wake up wider sections of the population, how we need to encourage people to wake up in order to take action on this. We need this shift in public perception, but we want to wake people up a little bit gently. We don't want too much trauma to be triggered by this. Although as you hear me hesitate as I say this, because that would be fine to be gentle maybe 10 years ago, but time is running out now. So as we probably saw from Joe Biden's summit this week, he's saying the next 10 years are crucial. So there is this pressure, there is this internal pressure emotionally, as well as external pressure. And it's this interrelationship between the internal world of the individual or the couple and the external world that we're working with. I said to a group yesterday, 
I no longer see myself psychotherapeutically as working in the therapeutic dyad. I now see myself working in a therapeutic triad with the environment and with uh, nature, because for people who are struggling with the consciousness, the awareness of this, they cannot separate themselves out away from the awareness of the relationship with the planet, the relationship with the other. So the way to approach that therapeutically is to bring the environment, bring nature into the therapy relationship. Gus Beth was a climate scientist who was the US advisor, who I think uh, made a wonderful argument about the role of psychology in this. He said, I used to think top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. And with 30 years good science, we could deal with those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are actually selfishness, greed and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And scientists don't know how to do that. I don't want to offend anybody when showing these images. I I'm, can assure you I'm not taking COVID lightly or seeing it as not a significant problem for humankind. But I do think these cartoons show scale rather beautifully because we've got to keep in mind that climate anxiety, eco-anxiety, climate distress is an emergent mental health problem. And we honestly are just discovering what this is about at the moment. It's emergent, which means we're having to navigate this as we learn in practice. And of course we can call on existing psychological models, particularly trauma models, which I'll talk more about in a moment, to help us learn to navigate this. But it is very much in its infancy, I think, as an aspect of psychological psychotherapeutic work. So these are scientists saying they'll be happy when COVID as a crisis is over at scale. And climate change, of course, is much greater in the background. And this is even clearer where you've got COVID as a relatively small threat compared to recession, climate change and biodiversity. Technically, I think we should be putting COVID into the biodiversity collapse wave because COVID is with us, threatening uh, us globally uh, because of biodiversity collapse. So we have to frame it that way, really. And then there's these kind of things around, I really don't want to offend anybody, but she's saying, can we move these from the fiction to the non-fiction section? The Road, Planet of the Apes, The Trial, Brave New World. That there's a reality about the need to wake up to the fact that this has been there in discourse, in narratives, uh, in fiction for many years, but now we're starting to face the reality of this. And what this is, of course, is triggering in people is a terror, not just of environmental collapse, but also social collapse and political collapse, which is already starting. So when we're talking about climate anxiety, we have to take a global perspective. This is not just an individual struggle. It's also a collective, social, environmental, and political struggle and it's closely tied to the importance of keeping in mind the systemic importance of social injustice. There are people who I'm working with who are facing collapse today so their anxiety is not something in the future, their anxiety and their distress is about their struggle to survive today and I carefully use that word survive because what's underneath a lot of the anxiety is this terror about not surviving and we can see already extinction rates escalating and we can see already thousands of people around the world losing their lives because of the climate emergency so this is not something that we can comfortably say oh we will deal with this in the future i'm afraid we're failing to deal with this today so Paul Hoggett in the Climate Psychology Alliance, I think I, I really appreciate his quote because I think it frames things beautifully again. Um, he says, we're living in a time when a tragedy which is without precedent is unfolding in front of our eyes. We are witnessing catastrophic rates of species extinction, biodiversity loss, soil and ocean exhaustion and runaway climate change. There's two key words in here for us psychologically, and it's the fact that we are living during this time and it is unfolding and we are witnessing this happen so we are witnessing our own extinction our own annihilation we are witnessing the changes that are taking 
place across the planet in a way which is unprecedented. We've never negotiated anything on this scale before. When people try to sort of think about psychological frames to help us understand this, they look to things historically that humanity has faced and survived, like world wars, like tsunamis, like the Cuban Missiles Crisis. These were globally threatening, and COVID, of course. These are globally threatening. However, with those, we could imagine, we could fantasize life on the other side of those, more or less going back to normal. And certainly the vast majority of people being okay. Certainly we see that in the narratives when people talk about COVID, when we get beyond COVID, when we get vaccination, when we beat this thing. The problem with this fantasy, it will not extend itself to the climate and biodiversity crisis because it's already too late, I'm afraid, to go back to where we were before. Even if we went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow, and I'm going to say at this point, I'm really sorry that what I'm saying is really painful to hear. And it's really important that we find ways to communicate about this that people can understand. Even if we went to zero carbon emissions tomorrow, it's too late. It's too late for the Maldives. It's too late for Bangladesh. It's too late for the low-lying Pacific nations. It's too late for significant millions of people around the world. It's too late for the animals that are already going extinct. And that's not to say in that critical messaging that it's too late to do significant things that we could start to do to sort of mitigate this, but it, it's too late to be thinking, well, we can deal with this later on down the line because it's too late to do that. We will have to deal with the fact that there will be millions of climate migrants increasingly around the globe. It's going to be a global issue for us. And that is gonna cause huge, huge levels of emotional distress as well as physical distress. And I want to call on, I want to take this opportunity. Thank you so much for inviting me. I hope you're not regretting it as you listen to me. I want to call on the psychological professions and psychiatry professions, mental health professions. We have a job to do, which is about getting an understanding of this for ourselves so that we can support others in learning how to navigate this. Because there's going to be a lot of people that need our help with this. There already are. So what are we talking about? We're talking about this dawning of the Anthropocene and there is no blueprint for this. So we're being forced psychologically into paths that we've never been down before. We would be delusional if we thought that technological solutions were enough on their own. They are of course crucially important, but they're not enough on their own. So what we're facing here is some kind of minimizing and denial about the scale of what we've got to face. And psychologically, this means facing painful truths. It is an opportunity to evolve psychologically and in terms of our mental health in humanity. There are phenomenal opportunities in this, but in order to grasp those opportunities, this is depth psychology, requires us to look at what's underneath the surface. We've got to look at our defenses and this requires transformation rather than surface level change. And of course we defend against things that feel unbearable or threatening. And this is too big frequently a lot of the time for us to comprehend as humans. So what I'm using is a psychological frame which includes the unconscious mind. We cannot tackle this through positivist psychological approaches that focus entirely on conscious awareness. As far as I'm concerned, my argument would be uh, everybody on the planet is struggling with eco-anxiety right now. I think you've got to have been living under a rock to not be aware of what's going on in the world. However, so whilst I think everybody is struggling with eco-anxiety, significant numbers of people are in denial are in pushing it into their unconscious mind. So they're unaware of this. Significant numbers increasingly are becoming aware. And that's when we see it manifest on the surface as eco-anxiety. But I think everybody has got it under the surface. And we see the kind of reactivity and the rage in people when people wake them up to this. So, for example, some of the kind of attacks on youth climate strikers and particularly Greta Thunberg, where the, you know, significant numbers of people thought it was perfectly OK. I'm sure nobody here did, but thought it was OK to have images online of Greta Thunberg being gang raped 
with messages being put out there into the world that she's frightening children. She's not frightening children. She's just waking adults up to their denial and their disavowal and their dismissal of the significance of the crisis that we're facing. But rather than listen to her, she's triggering rage in people and terror in people, and they attack her as a result. Mm -hmm. The other really important thing is to keep in mind, this is a Jungian frame, a psychoanalytic frame, is that we are all swimming in the same sea of the collective unconscious, which is why I talk about this being both an individual personal issue, plus a social collective issue, and a global issue, that we have solutions to some of this, I believe, in the collective unconscious through shared imagery and empathy and compassion in developing global compassion and empathy. I wouldn't want anybody to take away my anxiety or my depression or my grief or my despair or my rage about how I feel about the environmental destruction that, that we see going on. I want to use that empathy and compassion to help me understand others, but also to develop empathy and compassion globally with the people who are facing the immediacy of this today. So what I'm talking about here is developing a lens. How do we apply this to practice as psychologists and psychotherapists or mental health practitioners in the same way as we have this construct of a trauma lens where if you look through the lens you can understand people's suffering and struggles and behavior through in the light of the trauma that they suffered in earlier life and that they organize a lot of their lives around repetitive patterns of reliving or trying to avoid traumatic memories and reminders and feelings. I think we need to start to develop to become a climate crisis aware therapist or practitioner. We need the climate change lens through which we would look and adapt our practice to understand that maybe through the unconscious with people, what they're talking about is eco-anxiety and they're not consciously aware of it. Some people are consciously aware of it, some are not. I'm increasingly having people bring dreams to psychotherapy and they're not presenting to therapy as eco-anxious, but they're bringing dreams which I could interpret as an unconscious eco-anxiety, dreams of insects dying around the house, for example. We can interpret that in terms of what do the insects mean to you personally, yeah, but I also think we have to interpret it in terms of in what way are you unconsciously traumatized and terrified about the loss of biodiversity and the forthcoming collapse if we lose our insects. So it's about both. It's about looking at things personally and looking at them collectively and looking at things environmentally, which is an example of how I want to invite the environment into the practice room now. And just to think of this as anxiety would be uh, also a bit of a mistake. Anxiety is the first thing that's felt when we face threat. As I've already said, this is threatening. So anxiety is a very emotionally healthy response. So I want to talk to, I talk with clients about the emotional climate that they're facing. And I also talk about emotional biodiversity because a great deal of the work that I'm having to do is in helping people allow this complex mix of feelings. Again, this is not uh, a psychological approach which says we want to fix or get rid of or reduce anxiety or depression or grief or hopelessness. We need those feelings if we're going to take action on the crisis, on the threats that we're facing collectively. So we have to find a different way to navigate with these feelings and look for the meaning in these feelings rather than try and get rid of them. It's the opposite of trying to get rid of them. We need to be feeling these. We, Greta Thunberg says, I want you to panic. Well, I, she has a point. We should be feeling that urgency and that distress because that could lead to greater collective action. And that's the only way to reduce eco-anxiety is to uh, in, increase action on the biodiversity and climate threat. So you can see that kind of dilemma and paradox and the need to develop different psychological models and pathways through this. So anxiety is the gateway emotion, but it frequently moves into a sense of grief, nostalgia, hope and hopelessness, anger, blame, frustration, guilt, 
huge amounts of guilt, fantasies of rescue. Oh, the government will save us. Apocalyptic fantasies. Oh, we're all going to die. And there's frequently a split between the, oh, it'll be all right. You know, the government will save us. You know, we'll develop the technology, which is a, a denial, frankly, or the apocalyptic fantasies of we're all doomed, we're all going to die. Now, interestingly, both of those are, are, are ways to try and escape reality, which is at the center of both of those. And the reality is centered in facing, standing and not responding to either of those and facing our vulnerability and the uncertainty that humanity is facing at the center of this. And the avoidance and nihilism and despair, quite honestly, is understandable. It carries meaning. But we obviously don't want to be so overwhelmed by these that we get stuck and can't function. So the trick is to allow, make space, value all of these feelings in response to this, but not be overwhelmed, not get trapped in them. There is generalised rises in anxiety globally. Uh, this is some uh, statistics from uh, the UK. The UK cases of anxiety have trebled in a decade due to the financial crash, austerity, huge apologies for this world, Brexit, climate change and social media. They analysed six and a half million patients. This is a large scale analysis. It's specifically affecting younger women aged 18 to 24, um, 30%, but it's rising in all groups. So this is an increase of anxiety, which is escalating. There is the same trajectory in men, although fewer were diagnosed. Numbers specific to eco-anxiety, well, a YouGov poll last year, and this is interesting because this was done during COVID, reported that 70% of 18 to 24 year olds were more worried than the year previously. So despite being in lockdown and facing COVID, young people are increasingly more and more and more anxious about climate crisis. Most of the young people I'm working with felt huge frustration about the capacity of people to move swiftly on the threat from the COVID virus in comparison to the threat from the climate emergency. That increased their distress. They were more anxious as a result. Not that they thought that COVID wasn't a problem, they saw it was, but they perceived climate quite correctly as a bigger problem. Teachers are seeing higher levels of climate anxiety in students and children are being taught about climate science and climate change in schools, but usually in science and geography classes, and they're not being given enough support to talk about how they feel. The Royal College of Psychiatrists here in the UK has recently put advice on its website for parents and carers, which the Climate Psychology Alliance contributed to. There's some excellent advice there. Again, not framing it as a mental illness, but talking about it as an understandable distress that we need to know how to talk to children and young people about. So I think I've already defined this. It's this living with this awful uncertainty about whether we will take enough action in time to reduce the spread of the more extreme impacts that are already appearing globally. And it's a healthy response. And it's a, this is how we measure mental health by looking at our capacity to respond to external reality. So conversely, I could argue that not having eco-anxiety makes me wonder about your mental health. I think it's mentally unhealthy to not have this concern. The other important thing to mention here, though, is that eco-anxiety is not just in response to environmental degradation. All of my research and therapy practice for the last six, seven years is showing me that what people are feeling is anxiety about the climate and anxiety about the environment. But this is made infinitely worse by the failure of adults to act and specifically the failure of governments to act, because these are the people that we perceive as having the power. These are the people that we elect um, and we uh, assume they will look after us. We assume that they will take steps to take care of humanity and governments are struggling to take sufficient action for various reasons, political, economic, pressure from oil companies, but governments have the power to act, as do adults. And children and young people in particular are left feeling betrayed and abandoned at the failure of adults to take responsibility for this. 
So the, I'm noticing a range of eco-anxiety in practice from mild feelings, which are transient and can respond to reassurance and focus on a kind of optimism that oh, we will be able to deal with this. There is a hope for the future to medium, where you start to doubt other people's capacity to take action. There's a disillusionment in people in power and lifestyle changes are made, but it's still manageable. And this moves into a significantly more cruel and painful awareness where there are few defenses against the anxiety. It's harder to mitigate this distress. There's increased guilt and shame a loss of faith in others to take action. And it starts to have a significant impact on relationships. Couples who I'm working with are splitting up over this, where one partner is really anxious, really aware, maybe a, an activist, and the other partner is saying, no, I can't cope with this, it's not that bad. No, you're frightening the children. No, we're not gonna make these changes. And they're unable to reconcile themselves within the relationship. I know a couple that separated because they've retired and he wanted to continue flying and having holidays abroad. She wouldn't because of this. And it led to a breakdown and a divorce in their relationship. Now you might want to say, well, maybe they needed to divorce anyway. Yes, maybe, but what I'm noticing is that more and more couples are not able to negotiate and navigate these threats number of couples who are struggling to make the decision to have children is increasing in my experience where one partner wants to have children the other partner does not want to have children specifically and explicitly because of climate change they love each other but they cannot resolve this problem when it's severe there are intrusive thoughts sleep is affected there's no respite from the fear anticipation of extinction anticipation of collapse, no belief in others' capacity to care. In the Climate Psychology Alliance, Sally Weintraub talks about the culture of uncare and how this gets extended explicitly through the climate crisis. People are unable to work and can become suicidal. I'm working with a number of young people who are suicidal over this and they are saying why should I want to live in a world that just does not care there's no underlying psychopathology these are secure young people they are engaged in the world and they cannot bear the grief and the distress uh, living in a world that doesn't seem to care about the rest of the world I mentioned solstalgia and eco grief earlier. Solstalgia is a very specific form of grief about loss of place. It comes from an attachment and a love of the world. And it's a particularly traumatic grief um, about negatively perceived changes to the environment. Frequently what this can lead to is a disenfranchised or a disallowed or an interrupted grief where other people around you don't understand the grief that you're feeling, for example, in relation to the billions of animals who died in the Australian wildfires, for example. So you're, again, you're on your own. This is a transition uh, process which I've been using a lot, particularly working with young activists, to show them about the importance of the range of emotional responses, particularly the guilt, the depression, because depression is something that we often kind of try to move away from or try to reduce because it's so crushing and debilitating. But depression for me in dealing with eco-anxiety is actually crucial to recovery, crucial to the recovery and moving to a radical acceptance of that we need to do something about this and taking the anxiety with you. I get rather frustrated by the kind of narrative in the world of, you know, the cure for eco-anxiety is eco-activism. Well, A, eco-anxiety does not need to be cured. It needs to be understood. So I don't want to get rid of it. I want to look for the meaning in it. And B, it's a shortcut to go straight to activism without going into the depression and the grief and the despair. And a lot of activists burn out because they throw themselves into activism in the hope that this will resolve their anxiety and that something will change. But they end up burning out and getting despairing because it's not grounded in this sense of depression 
and grief about the damage we've already caused. So it's not sustainable activism in the long term. I talk to them about the need to develop sustainable emotional activism and emotional intelligence as part of that. The defenses that we would be talking about psychologically, are, I've talked about denial. There's very little pure denial left in the world. Mostly I think we've got disavowal where one part of you says, oh, this is awful, this is terrible, this is really worrying. And then the other part of you says, yeah, but I can't wait for COVID to get sorted out so that we can go off on holiday and we can fly to New York to go shopping again. Or, you know, I'm so tired of this lockdown. And it's like, well, how do, how do these two things exist in the same mind? You know, we need to reduce flying, but then you're in denial of the part of you that's worried about flying. And these two parts don't join up. They're not in relationship with each other. So disavowal pushes away and minimizes the distress. It's close to wishful thinking. Some people are acting out. Some people are saying, well, if we've only got 10 years left, I'm just gonna fly every six months and I don't care. I'll be dead anyway by the time the worst of this happens. You know, <laughs> my next door neighbors say this on a regular basis and I just think well yeah okay maybe this is a reality maybe that's how you deal with your anxiety but where's your compassion for children where's your compassion for the rest of the people around the world it splits people off from that humanity and that shared collective responsibility and it's a really harsh defense and underpinning a lot of this is this disconnect, the othering of the natural world. If we see ourselves as disconnected, this is the eco-psychology aspect of this. If we don't see ourselves as part of nature, part of the environment, part of the natural world, then, and if we just invest in these modern constructs of progress, then we will continue to treat the environment as uh, a resource that we can continue to exploit. And a lot of people are turning to encounters with nature and the natural world to help themselves to heal from some of this distress. But for some people, this is actually increasing their distress because spending time in nature is just so painful. Uh, a 19 year old said to me, he said, I can't go and spend time in nature. He said, because all I do is look at the beautiful planet that we're destroying. He said, so I can't bear it, it's unbearable. So you've got people who are more connected environmentally and with nature and people who are more disconnected. And this is, again, speaking to the systemic change. This is a shift of consciousness or paradigm shift that's needed here. And this guy, I always have to talk about this guy. This is the Bramble Key Melamy. He's the first mammal to go extinct because of human caused climate change. And that's because he lived here on this low-lying island off the coast of Australia, which is now inundated with salt water. Now, many animals are going extinct all the time, but not mammals. This is the first mammal to go extinct. And of course, we're mammals. Now, we could say, well, you, we can live without him. Well, and, and this is true. We can live without him. However, I want to extend that thinking and show us where that psychological framing can go because then what stops us saying well we can live without giraffes we can live without polar bears if you put this into a biodiversity frame what we're doing is considering some parts of the world to be expendable so what happens if we then extend that to other countries and other people to the Maldives to Bangladesh what, what happens when we start to extend that to other groups of people around the world what happens when we've got millions of climate migrants? Do we think they're expendable? No. Europe is going to have to deal with this because we've caused the climate carbon emissions, as have other Western industrialized societies that have got us into this mess in the first place. So there is a collective call to action here to fairness and justice. So we have to be very careful about this thinking of we can live without him because... I'm very sad. I think we should grieve the fact we've lost him and say sorry. And that's that transformative relational response to this because it's their planet too. Now I want to start to pull it to a close because I want to leave a little bit of time for questions and comments as well at the end. Barack Obama, I think, framed this rather beautifully. 
psychologically, he said our children in the future will look back at us and ask if we did all that we could have done to deal with this, or did we avoid doing what needed to be done? So this is speaking to the intergenerational differences that we can see here. I've mentioned this uncertainty and the importance of this psychologically. Some of the only comfort we can get emotionally is an acceptance of some not knowing of what will happen and capacity to reflect on our own beliefs regarding uncertainty. Do they trigger us into, you know, wanting to sort of clutch at certainty and have absolute confidence in the science or to collapse into the kind of apocalyptic thinking? We risk psychological trauma and splitting and defences. And as I've just said, that splitting can happen intergenerationally, but it, that splitting could also happen between Europe and other countries. And I want to be very careful that we don't do that. So what, what will help? Well, we need to weigh up the science and facts with equal attention to feelings. We need emotional responses to this. We need to keep in mind uncertainties are experienced unequally. What can we else can we do psychologically? We have to put feelings into all of our solutions. And I talk about this being internal activism as well as external activism. Yes, we've got to take action in the world. Yes, we've got to plant more trees, do recycling, reduce carbon emissions, et cetera, et cetera. But we also need this internal activism, this emotional psychological moves that I'm talking about today, which are about building emotional resilience, deepening our capacity to understand emotionally what's going on under the surface. And we need to feel, then think, then breathe, then create collective understanding, and then we can take sustainable action in the world. So you can see how I'm framing this psychologically and in terms of external activism, both. We need both and solutions, not either or. And we need these mature defences. Mature defences, of course, are helpful. Some altruism, some courage, emotional self-regulation, self-sufficiency, humility, gratitude, humour, mercy, mindfulness, short-term suppression, tolerance, self-talk. These will help us navigate this, but they wouldn't shut us down. And this gives us this transformational move from eco-anxiety into eco-understanding, eco-empathy, eco-compassion, courage, community, awareness. We should not be doing this work purely in isolation. Supporting people in going to climate cafes, groups, working with communities is as important as individual work around this. And this is eco-connection, eco-belonging. We are actually all in this together, not equally, but we are all in this together and eco meaning, eco care, eco aliveness. There is transformational psychological change inherent in this, which brings comfort. Oh, so I'm sorry, uh, I'm so sorry, but we are almost um, finishing your time. Sorry, Caroline. Oh, I thought I had more time because... Uh, because of the previous delay, yes, in a sense. But I would like some people to ask questions because I think this is so interesting. Okay. If I would like to see if someone really wonders about all this. Uh, it's not uh, well. I, uh, you know I, understand. I understand. All right. Let me finish this quickly, and then. So I've, I've talked a lot about this re resolving, um, and we're needing to grieve. Let me just skip to. You don't need this. Let me just skip to this, James Hillman. So this is the summary, really, of this. He's arguing, how did traditional psychology get so lost and cut itself off from reality? Where else in the world can a human soul be so separated from the spirit of its surroundings? So psychology is dedicated to awakening human consciousness and psychology needs to wake itself up to an ancient human truth that people, we cannot be studied or cured separate from the planet. Because the truth is, is to live fully in the world means to also feel the anxiety that goes for the territory of being a, a vulnerable human being. So I will stop. 
Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. This was very, very interesting. Yeah, I understand. I, think, I, yeah, I always it's... try to talk too much. So I'm grateful <laughs> yes, you I saw you. Yeah, last time when I heard you last time, it was the same because this is really a and me and limitless uh, issue. And um, well, uh, I would like to ask you a question or I'll make a comment. Um, I have this sense of impending doom that maybe you you you, you talked about solar nostalgia. Well. Yeah. I talk about impending doom, I think yeah. it's the same thing. But I wonder if you were quite positive about that, but I wonder if most people make this connection between COVID and, cl and uh, climate change. I'm not so sure, maybe in England, maybe, but I don't think so. And, I, agree. Um, I agree, they're not making the connection at all. Can you um, talk a bit more about that? Because I would like people to, to be aware of this. I think I think you're absolutely right. People are not making the connection, uh, which is why I take every opportunity I can to make that connection and to connect it specifically with the biodiversity loss. Because COVID is not the first um, pandemic that we faced globally because of biodiversity loss. We had SARS, MERS, the Zika virus, HIV, AIDS. Uh, the reason that COVID has got much more uh, understanding is because it's global and the others stopped at the gates of Europe. And COVID will be nothing compared to the next one that will come if we don't start to deal with the biodiversity crisis and the way these things leap from as we stop, if we, as we reduce the space for wild animals in the world, this will continue, this will get worse. Um, COVID will be nothing compared to the next one. So we need to learn the lessons from COVID urgently. And we need to, one of the lessons of this is about understanding this sort of egoistic worldview that we've developed of progression and economic exploitation, that if we don't work in partnership with the natural world, we will make ourselves extinct very quickly. One of the children in the Maldives said to me, this is a 16 year old in the Maldives. He said, uh, he said, humans, he said, always fear death. He said, so we've created our own death and the apocalypse. Children are seeing the certainty of that in a clear eyed way at the moment. And I think they're embodying some of that doom and terror for the rest of us. So if adults don't wake up to this, we're betraying those children. Another child in the Maldives said to me, because the Maldives now will, be, will go underwater, the whole country will go underwater. So these children are facing their own annihilation. Another child said to me there, he said, well, he said, we saw online that people in Iceland had a funeral for a glacier. I don't know if you've seen it, it's a very be beautiful ritual they did. He said, well, this is fine. He said, but we're gonna be underwater soon. Who in the world is going to have a funeral for us in our country? Mm. So these children are facing extinction and annihilation and they can't escape from it. So, yeah, I think we have to be making that connection with COVID rapidly. Yeah, because we are invading animal territories. And uh, I don't know if people are aware of that. You know, we, are, yeah. we always think of ourselves as entitled to expand. Our yeah. territories, and now we are seeing the result. You know, the eating um, uh, uh, wild animals in China and the virus and all that. You know, it's yep. only one of the aspects. Of course, there are many, but it's it's awful. I wish people could see this more clearly. Uh, I would like to see if anyone has any question to Dr. Caroline because this is a very special occasion. We have to ask an expert about these issues. Let's hear some question, please. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, good. Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm not from uh, a psychology background, uh, so okay. this may, may seem a bit silly for no. my question. But no. what, what, how, how would you, or what do you do you say, or what treatment would you use? Treatment, maybe it's a kind uh, of the wrong word. Word okay. so, to someone who is getting more and more disappointed with uh, mm -hmm. their own species in this mm -hmm. case. <laughs> mm -hmm. and oh. Especially after the COVID and everything, because you see that people should be going towards a, a collaborative um, mm -hmm. point of view. And instead you see 
quite the opposite. So what would you say to a person with thinking about that? <laughs> It's a wonderful question. It's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, I, I sympathize. I empathize. I also feel enormous despair at uh, humanity and humanity's failure to empathize and care. And, but I think what's being revealed now is the fact we have failed to care for decades or centuries. And we are not rational creatures. If we were rational creatures, there would be no war. There would be no child abuse, you know, we're not rational creatures. So I first of all sympathize, absolutely. And I think it's really important to have the capacity to sympathize with the depth of the despair and disillusionment that I think is a healthy response. And I think what that then does is it allows us to connect and to empathize. You're not on your own with this. Uh, there are many of us who feel this way and not collapse as a result of this, right? So I want to have that capacity to feel that at death and then not use that despair to either hurt myself and turn it in on myself and self-harm or turn it out on others with a rage and want to hurt others. I think it's important that I have the capacity to bear that and to stand in that and deepen my capacity because then we have empathy, then we have compassion, then we have understanding. And then we have a chance psychologically to come together to change things. So it's that re response. Uh, and we may be going off a cliff as a species. We may well be going off a cliff as a species. But this is, this is a kind of psychological move that holds the tension between the naive hope, which is really pointless, and the apocalyptic thinking. Mm -hmm. And actually in the middle of those two is radical hope. And radical hope says, okay, it's bad. And there's things we can do about it. And we may be going off a cliff, but I'm going down fighting. And I am going down building as many good relationships from my heart with as many people as I can do. And then there is a chance, there is a chance that some good things can transformatively come out of this. So that radical hope idea, I think, is really crucial in holding us in that despair. And that despair connects you globally with the despair of the children in the Maldives. I used to cry after every conversation with these children. I still would. Um, but they are really appreciative that I'm there listening to them and that I'm coming back here talking about this and that has meaning so it's always about looking for that meaning you know I think this is the work of the soul and what else could we do we're living here now we're in, we're in, we're incarnated here now so we have to do our best with that thank you thank you very much it was a wonderful a wonderful presentation thank you thank, thank you. you caroline i wish someone 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 else would ask a question but uh, maybe people well it's already after four and uh, any question um clara it's it's mike michael here oh, yes i can see um, you i can hear you yeah yeah um caroline just to say thank you very much for a very powerful Uh, presentation and contribution to our conference. Thank you. Um, I I very much think that the the balance is more in relation to the danger of global complacency. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Despite what we've been seeing in recent times, yeah. um, that is a greater danger for the global population. Yeah. than uh, severe and disabling panic and anxiety. Hmm. However, as an individual therapist, if one is um, uh, asked for help from an individual who is severely disabled hmm. by their mental state that is hmm. prompted by eco-anxiety and even eco-depression, hmm. um, Don't you think that 
a lot of what you've said, although I have to say that what you just and your answer just now to Anna was probably an answer to this question mm. that, that, that what you're suggesting in terms of it being a healthy and normal response, which I agree with you on, mm. uh, nevertheless, a person has come to you for help with a, yep. technically a disability. Um, isn't it a council of despair simply to say, and I'm sure you wouldn't, you wouldn't be saying this, well, don't worry about it. Uh, well, not don't worry about it. Do worry about it because that is a normal response. Mm -hmm. and, and to actually say that don't get into activism because that will prove to be just short-lived and you will burn out. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I always uh, support people in... Um, uh, external activism, always. And I, I work a great deal with activists who are burning out. Um, uh, so I, I try to support them in their activism, but not sort of see, not encourage them to have an attachment to this idea that activism will fix everything. Uh, so they also have this internal activism, which is about sort of strengthening their emotional resilience around this. Uh, I am. I, I. I consider myself to be an activist. I think psychotherapy as activism is exactly where we need to be going now. Um, and I'm writing court reports, um, supporting activists in court, using uh, eco anxiety as a necessity uh, in, in, to defend them in court. So I'm really interested in looking at how we can work together interprofessionally with the legal arguments. The, to challenge that I agree with you Mike this complacency uh, as a form of activism at the same time as the internal psychological moves that I think people need to be able to take so that they can tolerate and still live a, min a, a meaningful life um, I hope that was clearer that I'm by no means uh, steering people away from activism I have a firm yeah. believer in it but just not to over invest hope that that will fix your feelings because there's a sure. risk, there's a risk that at some activism is is an escape from feeling, and then this this form of activism is you know full of rage and burnout, um, yeah. and that's just you know yeah. painful. <laughs> it's an interesting point you make about um, um, the legal side mm. of this, all of this. Um, we have an issue, and I'm sure people in other countries will identify with this, but um, because we have statutory regulation of our um, particularly clinical psychology profession and obviously psychiatry, yeah. we are now encountering issues where um, our members are um, being uh, arrested for active uh, yep. climate change demonstration yeah uh, such as with the extinction rebellion yeah and then they are being disciplined by the professional body because any um, criminal offense will trigger an investigation and in many cases striking off from the professional body which then deprives yeah. you of your profession and your livelihood yeah and uh, and my 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 professional body, this is different from the registration body, um, is actively campaigning and discussing with the professional, with the statutory body, for this not to take place. Yeah. Because it not only is it an issue for those people who have been arrested and prosecuted, it's yeah. an issue for the rest of the membership because it puts them off actively demonstrating. I about agree. the climate crisis. I, I absolutely agree. We've been debating this at length in the Climate Psychology Alliance um, and we're lobbying as well with different professional bodies uh, that they shouldn't you know, take this action because this is a you know activism out of necessity um, and there is a, a legal defense of necessity attached to this. So we, we're also very involved in lobbying all the different professional bodies, but we're also involved in lobbying them to get climate psychology including as included in all the statutory trainings so that that is understood as a psychologically healthy response. So I think we've got to approach it both ways. That's why I'm very keen. I mean, I've had court reports uh, accepted by the courts um, 
Um, and it has, so far, it has been effective in getting sentencing altered. So young activists have not been sent to prison as a result, but they've been given community service. So we're kind of going in the right direction. But, we're, you know, yeah, no, absolutely. But we've got to have it in the curriculum. We've got to have it uh, as part of every psychology training. And then we'll start to see the professional bodies influence differently. But, you know, I gave this talk, um, similar version to 300 GPs last week, doctors. Um, tomorrow I'm giving this talk to uh, the Met office and the meteorological societies. Um, I've given this talk to the British Army. So as far as I'm concerned, it's about kind of getting this interprofessional understanding of this. And then we can protect our psychologists from from this. And it's absolutely wrong that they're losing their professional status. It's appalling. Um, and I anticipate there will be apologies in the future because, you know, in the same way as there were apologies for prosecution of suffragettes in the future. You know, they should not be being prosecuted. The more worrying thing is, I know, you know, I think you're in the UK, aren't you, Mike, is the criminalization of protests that's going on at the moment. Um, and the way that police are targeting activists' partners, not just the activists, but they're arresting activist partners to try and stop activists taking action. So I kind of uh, do see this as uh, an important fight. I want to quote um, the ecologist Raymond Dasman says that, uh, so this is the socio-political aspect of this, right? The ecologist Raymond Dasman says World War Three has started. This is the war of industrial humans against the earth. He's correct. All of us are warriors on one side or another. There are no sidelines, there are no civilians. Ours is the last generation that will have the choice of wilderness, clean air, abundant wildlife and expansive forests. The crisis is that severe. We have to all act now. It's a fabulous quote. Problem is it was published in 1991. So we've known this for decades. I'm looking forward to the day in the future where people who fail to act are prosecuted. And it's criminal, the failure to act on this is criminal. Not acting on this is the problem. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant from me. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Caroline. Thank you. And uh, Mike, are you there? Well, he seems to have disappeared. Thank you. And uh, I think, uh, well, it's time to say yes. goodbye. And, uh, okay, I'm fine. Oh, you are. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, do you want to ask some, uh, Caroline something else? Or, uh, no, no, that was a great answer. Thank you very much. Answer, yeah, yeah, I didn't know. I learned Thank a lot of things, Caroline. It was good. Thank you Thank so you. much. And uh, see you again, Caroline, soon. Thank you. Thank you okay. very much. Enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you very much. So we will we'll have a, a session right now right next to this uh we we were supposed to have